Hey everyone, welcome back to 51%'s Crypto Research Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Shaughnessy. Today, I had the pleasure of having on Mason Borda, the co-founder and CEO of TokenSoft. I think this is a great episode, given we've already had numerous security token companies on the podcast, ranging from Polymath, which was our first episode with Trevor Coverco, to Consensus Capital, Harbor, Securitize, and others. This conversation rounds out our STO coverage well. Mason covers his history at BitGo, where he focused on custody solutions and gets into what TokenSoft does on a daily basis. He walks us through all the components of the TokenSoft platform and shares some great stats, such as how the platform was able to handle the onboarding of thousands of customers in a short time frame. As always, we point our listeners to 51%'s research on 51pct.io for those looking for the best crypto analysis and research. Add your email on the site for research alerts. It's definitely worth it. With that, here's my conversation with Mason. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I have on Mason Borda, the co-founder and CEO of TokenSoft. Mason, how's it going? Hey, it's going well to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on. So uh, let's jump right in. Tell us a bit about Mason and how you got started in crypto. Uh, yeah, it's uh, so, so uh, obviously I, I had heard about uh, Bitcoin on and off. Um, but this was late. 2013, 2014, we, uh, me and my uh, friend decided to start a, uh, a payments rail uh, for, uh, for uh, just payments uh, in, the, in the U.S., so U.S. dollar payments. And as we went through that process, uh, we came across Bitcoin as one of the potential competitors. And uh, I remember reading the Bitcoin white paper and looking into it and thinking, uh, no one's going to use this. The price moves around. It takes too long to, to send money. Um, and so uh, we, we tried building a, a dollar-based uh, dollar blockchain instead. So uh, we forked Litecoin. I built wallets, indexers, APIs, and apps on top of that. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so spent about a year uh, building it and a month talking to lawyers before uh, we figured out there was a lot more to it if we wanted to go that route in terms of getting proper licenses. Uh, so yeah, ended up at a company called BitGo, and uh, that was that was the uh, that that was it. Um, so just stuck in the industry since then. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, one of my first reports when I started fifty one percent was on custody, and and there was definitely a big focus on BitGo. What did you do at BitGo? Yeah, just uh, working on the software side of things. Uh, so, uh, yeah, one of the I think one of the more interesting things I got to work on there was uh, at one point we did a project with the CME group. So I got to build the cold storage wallets uh, for that. Uh, that was really interesting. But I got to work on different things. Uh, at one point we had a product called uh, BitGo Instant, which was uh, designed to enable. Uh, instant clearing or near instant clearing of transactions uh, between fellow Bitco exchanges. Um, so uh, there's a couple of different cool things I got to work on. At one point, um, I think it was the the Augur team came in and they needed help setting up a wallet. And so got to help them out. And that turned out to be the first uh, s- such, uh, the first uh, ICO on, on Ethereum uh, in August of 2015. And so uh, I got to see some interesting things uh, while, while I was there. That's that's interesting. So, how has your thoughts about custody changed since your time at BitGo till today? Do you still think it's kind of you know the holy grail of getting traditional finance involved? Uh, yeah, I mean, back then we were just helping uh, helping people get set up with wallets, so just helping them uh, hold and move their Bitcoin. It was a very easy to use uh, product for any company that was looking to get up and running quickly with with Bitcoin. Um, obviously, the the product evolved, um, and as as I've sort of moved on uh, from there, I think one thing that I've noticed was uh, in the market in general um, is every company really has bespoke needs when it comes to custody, and so uh, back then custody was just wallets. Uh, today, I think custody has uh, a lot more uh, complex needs. And so, um, so some companies may need to bring it in-house. They may have their own compliance requirements, their own architecture requirements or vendor requirements. And so um, 
they may need something unique. Um, but there's it's custody isn't one size fits all. And then if you look at it from a regulatory aspect, so that's more product integration, um, is everyone has bespoke needs. But if we look at regulatory uh, needs, um, it's a lot more complex. Um, there's uh, custody for for digital assets like Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, the regulations are very binary. It's very straightforward. Uh, when it comes to securities, uh, the regulations are more comp- complex um, because they they try to prevent against um, you know the wrong psychology when it comes to investments. Um, or that, that's how it seems. That's how I think of it. Um, and so the the regulatory needs are a lot more complex. And so the custody administration of digital securities, I think of as something. Uh, a little more nuanced. Um, and so there's additional features that are necessary there. So yesterday we announced uh, the launch of uh, Knox Wallet, uh, something we've had uh, deployed with all of our uh, issuers or all of our clients um, since, since day one. And, um, and that's designed to, uh, to, to have a lot of those administrative features which digital securities need uh, in order to sit into custody and to be, uh, to be administered and managed. That's super interesting. I definitely want to get into Knoxwall and, and your offerings there. I guess my last question, though, for custody is, um, you know, my view early on was that a lot of the traditional players want a custody solution through a large existing bank, say Bank of America, Fidelity, et cetera, and didn't really want to partner with, say, a startup at the time. Do you think that that at a high level is switching and, and traditional finance is kind of coming around to the idea of partnering with a crypto startup for custody? Uh, yeah, I think I think there's there's two facets there. So fr- from uh, from their perspective, obviously they want to plug into the same vendors they've always been using. They want to uh, you know they want to keep operating as normal. Um, I, I think uh, when it comes to the blockchain, the technological and cybersecurity risks are very high, um, and so I, I think that's one thing that they are starting to come come to terms with is that. Um, there's not too many people that understand custody and understand how to build uh, build tooling for it, and so I think when it comes to uh, to sort of that that aspect of things, um, I think they are becoming more open to to working with with startups. Um, but I think uh, a good example of an institution that's that's just embracing it and, and figuring out is, is uh, Fidelity when when they launch their their uh, Fidelity Digital Assets, they announced they're they're doing custody. Uh, and so some people want to take this in house. They want to, they want to figure it out. Um, but uh, we are seeing that the folks are open to um, to using third parties as long as it meets their own their own requirements. That that makes a lot of sense. So I guess it makes sense to get into the high level questions on digital securities before we jump into token soft specifically. So I guess Mason, what's your take on you know why do we need to issue digital securities today? Um, yeah, so I, I can't I can't speak from the need aspect of it. That's not you know necessarily where our business is. Is you know we we have issuers come to us uh, sort of already um, viewing it as 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 something they want to undergo. But I, I think I can probably touch on um, what's fundamentally different about it and where the innovation is probably going to stem from um, if we look at it from from a technology perspective. Yeah, and I I, I think. Um, so if, if we if we look at uh, digital assets like like Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, there there's 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 certain there's certain elements to to the technology. It's it's peer to peer. It's decentralized. Uh, it has you know anyone can access it. Uh, people say it's permissionless. And uh, some but not all of these aspects transfer to, to digital securities. And so one of the one of the uh, one of the features that do transfer, since we're using you know the same the same infrastructure for digital securities, is uh, the twenty four seven accessibility. And so um, today in traditional markets, they're open nine to five. Um, you can trade a couple hours before and after as well. Um, but with with digital securities, there's the opportunity to um, to settle trades twenty four seven to initiate you know to have access twenty four seven. And so that's something that's uh, fundamentally uh, different about digital securities and something that, that wasn't possible for that's now possible. Um, another element uh, that, that transfers um, is sort of with, 
With things like Bitcoin, you can access it from anywhere in the world. You can send a payment from any, anywhere in the world. Um, that property also transfers over. And so, um, and, and one thing we've also uh, sort of forced uh, lawyers to do the past year is figure out global securities laws. Uh, and so uh, we, we can have these digital securities transfer um, internationally now uh, within their relevant compliance requirements. Um, and so I think those are two things uh, that are... Uh, that, that are fundamentally uh, different versus the traditional world. And those are the two things where, where um, I, I think any innovation that occurs or any killer app that comes about is going to be rooted into those two con- concepts. So, so one, just to recap, is the 24-7 accessibility. And, and number two is uh, the ability to, to have a compliant transfer from one jurisdiction to another um, and, and to have that perpetuate you know, uh, f- further than that. That's that's interesting. The twenty four seven piece is interesting. I know T zero just launched, and I'm pretty sure I saw a tweet where they're only allowing trading during you know normal Wall Street hours from nine thirty to four. I thought that was hilarious. They raised a hundred million bucks or over a hundred million in ICO, and they couldn't enable trading twenty four hours a day. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, the the compliance requirements are complex. So I, I think people are still taking the technology and they're figuring out how to map it into the existing regulatory structures. And um, I, I, I view this as maybe a first step um, to, to getting there. And, and you know, once uh, once once these companies are, are comfortable with it, I, I do think we'll we'll get there. Um, but it's a matter of uh, uh, going one step at a time and not you know, not spooking regulators, making sure they understand everything that's going on. Uh, making sure that um, all the people that are involved understand all the rules and, and are comfortable with it as well. Got it. And so just to recap, I mean, the two reasons you're seeing, the two key reasons are the 24-hour trading and the global law accessibility. But I mean, do you think that there's you know other perks of security tokens? Like, do you think that it? a lot of uh, people I talk to say it reduces the illiquidity premium of these large assets because you could break them down into smaller chunks? Um, do you see that as a benefit or, or not so much here? Yeah, um, we exist more on the technology side. So I think when it comes to things like that, uh, we're, we're, we're perhaps not, not the best uh, to, to speak on those aspects. But I, I, think, I, think the, um, I, I think a lot of the benefits we don't know yet. And so I think that the reason I rooted into those two benefits is because I think that any innovation that does come about or any killer app that does come about is going to be based off of a lot of iteration we do around those two concepts. Um, so when it comes to uh, liquidity or liquidity premiums, things like that, I, I, don't, I don't know yet. It could be that that's just something that's theoretically interesting uh, that won't actually materialize into, uh, you know, the killer feature, the killer app. Um, so it's, but I think if we look at it from a technological perspective, I think um, digital securities are going to manifest in a way that we, we don't expect them to today. And I think the benefits are going to be, um, Things that again we we don't we don't foresee uh, foresee today. That's interesting. Well, let's get into TokenSoft and the tech platform because I think that's where the focus should be here. So, I mean, what's the what's the elevator pitch you give people when they ask, you know, what is TokenSoft? What do you guys do? Uh, yeah. So uh, we we uh, we're a technology and security platform, and we we. We essentially service companies that are seeking to use digital assets as, as a growth strategy. And so um, that can mean uh, any issuer that wants to issue a digital asset, digital security on the blockchain, um, we can help them uh, remain uh, within their re- relevant compliance requirements when they're onboarding investors and issuing that asset. Um, and so there's there's uh, there's basically two, two pieces to that. So... Uh, one is for for the onboarding of the investors, um, so we can help them uh, comply with the relevant banking securities and tax laws. Uh, when this digital security goes and, and moves uh, moves about, uh, we can also help them with the ongoing uh, compliance and, and administration there. And so um, that's that's sort of where we where we come in. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So if you had to give like the security token stack just like a visual landscape. You guys aren't dealing with, say, the issuance of these securities. You're dealing more with like the operational work that goes into issuing them. Like, where exactly do you guys fit 
in the stack here? Yep. Uh, so uh, there's there's I like to break down into three pieces. Um, so there's uh, there's primary issuance, uh, there's custody, and there's uh, the secondary markets. And so we we exist uh, on uh, with where those first two pieces uh, within those first two pieces. So we exist um, during the primary issuance phase, and we can help. Uh, basically configure compliance requirements into the token um, and help administer those um, as well. But we don't, we don't exist during uh, like execution of secondary trading or anything like that. That, that happens on, on regulated exchanges. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, since, you have, since your tech can be white labeled, do you think that it's possible for you guys to work with you know, some people who think you're competitors, like, are you guys here to work with, say, Harbor and Polymath, or are these technically your competitors? Because it sounds like your solution could be white labeled and be used by other companies, correct? Yeah. So I, I think in terms of, uh, you know, cybersecurity, uh, custody and scalability, um, we, we are, you know, the, the general market perception is that we are the leaders uh, there today. And so, yeah, if, if, if folks like, uh, Harbor uh, would like to uh, white label our platform because it can. Um, it is highly scalable. It is highly secure. You know, we we definitely welcome that. That that makes a lot of sense. So I've had on a lot of your. I, I don't know if you call them competitors, companions. Uh, you know, I like to think we're all working together. And um, I'm basically I'm blown away by the progress that STOs have made in the space. I I don't think people really expected us to have T zero launch or. You know, Spice VC to tokenize on uh, Securitize and all that stuff. Do you think that we're hitting kind of a ramp here in 2019, or do you think STOs are still, you know, a few years out from like total mainstream adoption? Yeah, I think uh, I think if we look at it uh, broadly, we look at the volume on the exchanges. I, I think we can we can es- essentially say that the market isn't there uh, yet. Um, and I think that it will take some some iteration and some some experimentation before this does become a real market. What I generally tell people is, you know, three to five years from now, this will probably mature into into something much larger, and that's when it'll start to take off. But um, when, uh, but I think today uh, we're still figuring out the building blocks necessary to allow this industry to scale, and so there's. There's technology pieces, there's regulatory pieces, and I think for uh, the the general market to to plug into this comfortably, I think all those building blocks need to exist first. So I think you know next one to two years are going to be people um, still figuring out what those building blocks are, making sure that um, folks can onboard onto those, and then from there it will take some experimentation to, to to scale. That's why in in December we announced. We uh, acquired interest in a broker dealer called uh, TokenSoft Global Markets, and uh, that's, that's because it's simply the case that we exist in uh, a space that's highly regulated. In order to um, help better service the market, we do need to uh, engage in, in in these regulated activities, and so um, through our affiliate broker dealer, uh, TokenSoft Global Markets, things like that are possible. Um, and so, just an example of some of these building blocks. Uh, we announced a uh, we announced uh, TokenSoft announced a a uh, relationship between TokenSoft Global Markets and Coinbase Custody, and uh, that's just be, uh, because as TokenSoft we see issuers needing a more institutional grade uh, experience, and through TokenSoft Global Markets they do have access to that when it comes to custody, uh, and so I think you'll see more of that in the next one to two years where. Um, where where folks engaging in this space are realizing that there are activities they can do, there are activities they can't do, and uh, to help move the market forward, it takes a combination of those two things in order to to help help the market scale and come to fruition. Got it. That's super interesting. So I saw that announcement. I think it was in late December between you guys and, and Coinbase Custody. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, what exactly is the benefit for Coinbase's customers here? Are you guys going to be custodying cryptocurrencies or are you going to be doing the custody for future security tokens trading on their platform? Where exactly do you guys play in or is it not decided yet? Yeah. Uh, well, with this relationship, the issuer uh, can custody assets uh, with Coinbase custody. 
Um, we will have more more information that uh, on this in the coming coming months, but um, for now, that's that's the relationship that that that's possible. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I just want to go back to your to your platform a little bit. I mean, you guys are the first STO based company that I've spoken with that basically has this white labeled kind of component, and I think that definitely sets you apart. Um, you know, could we, if we could walk through the components of the platform, I think that would make a lot of sense. I know you guys, you have the cold storage component, you have the KYC, the accreditation, and the smart contracts, and a few other components in there. Um, it, it maybe it would make some sense to just walk through the, the platform itself and, and each of the components. Uh, yeah. So um, there's uh, there's a few tools that we have to make this possible. So um, just very, very simply put, it's uh, the platform. Um, which the issuer uses to onboard um, individuals, or they may be investors or, or purchasers. Um, there's there's Knox Wallet, which is a self custody solution. Um, so we we token soft do not custody you know assets on behalf of of, of anyone. Um, and then there's a, a standard called ERC fourteen oh four. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about how those come together. So. Uh, during the issuance process, individuals come through the front door. Uh, they do have to go through a compliance process. And so um, that's where things like KYC ML come into play. That's where things like entity due diligence come into play. Um, for every, um, the, the way we approach it is uh, the market's still young. And so we still um, configure every client's compliance requirements uniquely. And that's because um, they may use different counsel, they may have different processes, they may have different domiciles. Um, and so um, everyone gets, gets a very uh, unique treatment when it comes to their compliance requirements. Um, after that, it's, it's like a, a, a typical uh, investment. If, if you've gone and you know, raised raise money for your company, uh, invest, the investor views you know, the relevant documents that the issuer wishes to display. Um, and th th those documents are executed, and um, there's there's a payment made. Uh, and uh, when that when that money comes in, it could go into uh, uh, into Knox Wallet. It could go into uh, escrow, um, and then that's that's the sale itself uh, generally. So that's that's one portion of it. Um, and then uh, the other portion is these digital securities have to come to fruition, and so. That's where standards like ERC-1404 come into play. That's where Knox Wallet, which is more geared for digital securities, comes into play. Um, and that's uh, and, and any ongoing compliance there, we, we, we can help with. Um, but uh, for every, every client, it's, it's different. There's uh, different regulatory structures for, for, for different clients and different ways in which we plug in there as a technology vendor. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I want to talk a bit more about the Knox wallet. I mean, you guys just released that. And one of the, well, two of the things that I like about it is I've seen around on Twitter, people really like the user interface. It's really easy to use. I think that's a major selling point considering crypto has terrible user interfaces. The other thing I really like is that the wallet could hold ERC-20 tokens, ERC-1404, which is alluded to, and tokens based on the standards of Securitized Polymath and Harbor. Um, you know, that's pretty interesting. I mean, are you guys kind of stepping on their toes here saying, hey, you know, we could hold assets you guys issue? Or is this, you know, all in good faith to build a wallet that um, others could use? Because I don't think Securitized Polymath or Harbor have their own wallet. I could be wrong. Um, we, we like to think of uh, everyone as a, a friend of TokenSoft. And uh, when we made uh, Knox Wallet, we, we kept this in mind. And so um, Knox Wallet is designed to be interoperable with all these standards. Um, and so if, if other folks, uh, exchanges, issuers uh, do want to use it an option, as an option because there is no uh, secure, scalable solution for custody of these digital securities, you know, we're, we're definitely happy to uh, to facilitate there. That, that's interesting. And I mean, the wallet can hold securities built on not just Ethereum though, right? It can support Stellar, R3, and Hyperledger as well? Um, currently, it, it's, uh, so currently, it supports Ethereum. Uh, we will announce additional support as we go. Yeah. But yeah, we do have clients that are issuing on uh, uh, Hyperledger or, or R3. 
Um, but the needs, the needs may differ. And, and the reason is, you know, again, everyone's compliance requirements are slightly different. And so um, we, we haven't announced support for additional assets uh, or additional blockchains yet through Knox Wallet. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. How has the, um, how's the response been in the market so far? I mean, like I just said, I saw a few tweets on Twitter from some prominent people, and it, it looks like the reception's been, been pretty stellar. Yeah, um, so uh, we, uh, you know, we did deployed the first version of this, um, w- you know, when we started in, in, in 2017 with, with our clients. And uh, generally, the reception has been that, again, the usability of it is, 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 uh, is very, um, you know, they're really happy with, with the usability of it. Um, I, I think, and we, we did start um, uh, rolling out the new version uh, to our clients and testing it with our clients uh, as well. And generally, the comments are, are yeah, around the usability. Um, there's, there's, I don't think many folks have had good experiences moving, moving crypto. Um, and so I, I think that's, uh, that's something that, that people definitely like. Um, the level of security um, is something that, that people really like. Um, there's nothing that's uh, cold storage, multi-sig, and, and this usable. Um, the, the first iteration um, that we did with, with cold storage multi-sig on, on, on Ethereum uh, took about, uh, it was 45 steps, and it took almost an hour to move uh, assets through that process. Um, and so we were very excited when, when, um, you know, when we started developing this to realize that we could do this uh, in just four to five steps per person and to make it a much quicker, seamless experience while keeping the assets in cold storage, uh, you know, only accessible by an air gap machine. So let's, um, just one question here. I mean, let's say that Securitize um, issue, let's say Securitize is successful in saying breaking up the Yankees into security token tranches that are, you know, five grand per token and somebody stores them on your wallet. Um, would would I be able to send them to somebody else that also has the Knox wallet, or do we need an exchange involved here, or, or users able to send these tokens to others using the Knox wallet, or is this more for kind of like institutional, you know, let's keep our tokens here? Yeah, there's uh, so there's one key distinction to make here. There's things that are uh, technologically and theoretically possible, and then there are things that are possible from a regulatory perspective. Um, so from a regulatory perspective, um, can, can you just uh, purchase the token, send it to your friend? Um, the answer is maybe, um, uh, the, it, can you do that with, with Knox wallet, um, from a technological perspective, if the issuer allows that transfer, uh, absolutely. Um, so yeah, this, this is a multi-sig wallet. It is designed more for, um, institutions or businesses. Um, and it's not ready for individuals yet. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind because, uh, you know, obviously two, two, two or more signatures are required, um, before facilitating a transfer. Um, and so, uh, yeah, is, is it, is it technologically possible? Yes. Is it regulatory possible? Is it possible from a regulatory sense? Uh, maybe. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm just stepping back on the Knox wealth though. I mean, are you guys technically competing with like Ledger here or are you guys working like with Ledger here? Like is your goal or hope that some people will say, you know, goodbye to their Ledger Nano S and use you guys for things other than security tokens, like just F- straight Ether and ERC20 tokens or? Yeah. So if we, if we dive really deep from an architecture perspective, uh, the one thing that we didn't want to do is is manage or, or, or help with uh, key generation and, and signing. Um, that's something that uh, we didn't know how to make usable at the time. And so our solution does use ledgers. Um, so keys are generated uh, in ledgers and they are used for transaction signing. Um, and so that is that is uh, what Knox Wallet uses for for keys for key management. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. That, that's super interesting. Best of luck with the wallet. It looks, looks really cool. And I want to go on to ERC-1404. Um, for those who are on their laptops or phones, you could go to erc1404.org uh, for info. But Mason, give us the lowdown on what this is and what you're hoping to achieve here. Yeah. Um, so when we started um, helping clients uh, in, in 2017, 
Uh, one set of requirements we kept hearing was that, you know, in, in the world of, of securities, there are transfer restrictions. There are, um, there are various uh, requirements that need to be fulfilled prior to transfer uh, of a digital security. And so um, we, we spent about, uh, about a year uh, speaking with uh, the top securities law firms domestically, internationally. Um, we uh, we did uh, demo this to to regulators as well, just so they knew how it worked, what the limitations were. It's really important to us that that regulators in general are um, uh, sort of understand how the tech works, and and that's that's time we're we're happy to put in. Um, and so at one point we did have the crypto czar uh, over for a demo as well um, of ERC fourteen oh four. Um, and the next thing we did was we're not building this standard for ourselves. Um, it's, it's not, uh, you know, the, it's, it's, it's more for the issuer and, and the exchanges. It's a piece of infrastructure that they can use. And so um, we, we also spent a lot of time speaking with exchanges and saying, hey, we're building this, but what, what, what do you really want? How, how do you want this to look and feel? And so um, we took all those requirements and packaged them into... Uh, ERC 1404, and so it's it's basically a way in which a uh, a manner by which an issuer can set the compliance requirements in their token uh, upon initial minting of the token or initial authorization of of the digital securities, um, so that they uh, they do have full control of their digital securities. And there's there's different you know there's different things you can do with it. Um, one requirement we heard was at one point was, uh, hey, we want this digital security to, uh, uh, if it's held by a U.S. Uh, investor, to only trade amongst other U.S. investors. Um, and then for any international investors, we want them to trade amongst themselves. But we do not want uh, the digital security to trade across uh, U.S. borders. So if uh, someone uh, in uh, the U.S. tries to trade with someone in Japan. You know, we don't want that to happen. That's something uh, we, we'd like to prevent. On that last point, though, I don't mean to, but you know, let, like let's say that an issuer follows the ERC fourteen oh four standard and they set restrictions on you know where things could be traded geographically. What happens if like where does the where does the you know firewall kick in per se? Like if if this token is in the Knox wallet, is it prevented at the wallet level from being transferred between borders, or is it kind of embedded in the code of the security token itself that it can't be in the wallet of somebody that's not on, say, a whitelist? How exactly does, how exactly do you police this? Yeah, so uh, the, the, uh, the ERC-14 over standard, when the smart contract is deployed, uh, it will track lists of authorized users. And so, um, and, and so what will happen is uh, if, uh, if that user tries to initiate a transaction across borders, uh, it will be transacting with the user on a different list. And so um, in, at the blockchain level, uh, the, the, the blockchain will reject the transfer. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, how has um, reception been for ERC-1404? People saying, you know, hey, thanks for kind of you know, setting all this foundational groundwork for us, or are people still kind of saying, hey, you know, we need a little bit more customization when we're doing our tokens? I'm just wondering how the uh, reception's been. Yeah, so um, I think our, our clients in general are, are happy that we've uh, done, uh, sort of taken leadership of this problem and, and figured out a solution for it. Um, so they're, they're, they're happy that there is a solution. Um, I think... Uh, in terms of you know their counsel, in terms of um, their compliance requirements, uh, they're happy that there is a solution that can help enforce the the nuances and complexity of those requirements. Um, so uh, sometimes when they when they come to us at first, they think you know uh, digital securities are are like um, they're transferred like Bitcoin. Uh, they're transferred around the world. There's no way to control them. Um, but when we tell them, hey, you know, if you have requirements that you need to meet, we can help you. Um, we, we can help you help you get there. They're they're generally very receptive to that, and that's just the way we operate. Um, we're not here to interpret laws. Um, we're here to you know, understand our clients' needs and to help package those into into technology. 
That's that's awesome. Well, I want to I want to get a little bit more into your products. I know we talked offline about you know how successful you guys have been in handling compliance for companies. Um, I know you shared a few stats. I don't know if we can go through them here, but um, how have like what have been the largest pain points from a compliance standpoint um, when you're dealing with your clients here, or you know are you guys the ones solving these issues so they're not really problems anymore? Yeah, um, so the, the compliance requirements are something we like to understand ahead of time. And so we do put a lot of time in understanding those and making sure uh, all of the stakeholders um, involved in a primary issuance for a client are, are happy uh, with moving forward. Uh, at the end of the day, we don't want to uh, push along anyone faster than they want to move through the process. Uh, we want to make sure that we can help them meet their, their compliance requirements. And so um, that's something that we're, we're we're more than happy to do. We're we're here to help people follow the law, and not you know be in breach of of, of the law. And so um, that's something we're 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 happy to help fi- figure out and and to to you know enforce in in our technology. That that's interesting. So you know, if a client comes to you guys and says, you know, hey Mason, you know, we think we're going to have you know a thousand individuals a day um, interacting with your platform. Are there any limits on, you know, what you guys can and can't handle from like a customer perspective? Uh, yeah. So I, th- I think what we've, we've proven out is definitely the scalability of our platform. And so uh, we have, uh, we have had a, a client which processed uh, about 28,000 folks. Um, and, and that was something over that happened over the course of a, a, a few days. Um, so we can manage very high throughput. Um, when it comes to processing individuals, entities through through KYC ML requirements, that doesn't mean that everyone will pass. Um, but we can we can scale our platform pretty well. Um, in terms of uh, security, uh, obviously transferring large amounts of of uh, digital assets um, is is something that that shouldn't be uh, you know that, that requires a lot of diligence, and so. Um, that's why our, our Knox custody solution is directly integrated with our platform in order to provide that level of security. Um, we don't hold private keys, but we, we do directly integrate it um, in order to, to help uh, enhance the level of security. So we have processed um, transactions in excess of, of uh, eight figures um, in, in digital assets. So the security is something we're, uh, we're very good at as, as well. Got it. That's interesting. So, I mean, after that scale and after the whole process, you know, kicks in, I guess there's a huge focus on what happens afterwards. So, you know, how much are you guys involved with like the post issuance compliance aspect of these things? Like, let's say distributions or dividends or or stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's, uh, again, from a regulatory perspective, there's things we can and can't do standalone. Um, when we work with our larger clients, they have, uh, they generally have a, a larger arsenal when it comes to regulatory licenses. So there's, there's more possible there. Um, but yeah, we, we can help uh, with those things um, as well. Um, but again, those needs are very uh, bespoke um, because there's procedures for, for undertaking uh, distributions um, and, and dividends. Um, and there's, there's a large focus on security with us. So just administering those tokens uh, or administering those activities through Knox Wallet is something that's you know done in a very secure manner as well. Um, so, so the answer is uh, yeah, we we can help out with with things like that. But uh, again, I can't tell you that we explicitly do it because it's a lot more complex than just uh, you know sending out a dividend or a distribution. Got it. That's interesting. So, you know, just stepping away from the products, you know, just going back to. Token soft and kind of the high level questions here. I mean, what's the number one item holding you guys back from you know turning this into a massive, massive business? I know you've been successful with obviously launches in the past, but what's the largest hurdle for Token Soft right now? Do you think? So I think um, uh, I think we're we're all uh, watching the market mature a little bit right now. So um, it's it's definitely larger players, and and there's different problems being figured out. Um, I think if I was to ask, if, if I was to make a wish um, for for one thing, uh, I, I would uh, I would wish for a Stripe Atlas type product um, for uh, banking and and securities licenses uh, around the world in every jurisdiction. 
Um, so I think uh, one thing that you'll you'll see us working on is definitely more more licensing um, in order to be able to better service uh, service the market. Um, but uh, but yeah, we're going to go step by step, and and uh, we're we're definitely happy to help um, help anyone that's looking to get through this process in a, in a compliant manner and in a secure fashion. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So you know, just on positioning here with kind of like the new era of security tokens, I always ask you know my guests on this topic. You know, do you see security tokens in this industry as disruptive to Wall Street, or do you view it as you know conducive and helpful? Yeah, so um, I, I think I think there are going to be things that are uh, that are that are possible now that haven't been possible before uh, by means of using the blockchain as infrastructure. I think that um, one thing that we're definitely noticing now is, and this is even outside of of the blockchain space, is uh, these large institutional firms have become really good at figuring out how the technology works and figuring out how to experiment and integrate it into their uh, into their uh, platforms and, and into their services uh, faster. And so, um, is it disruptive? Uh, absolutely, but. At the same time, uh, we see um, a lot of different enterprises, institutions figuring out how it works and trying to figure out how they can use it and leverage it. Um, a lot earlier in the in the you know life cycle of this industry, um, and so that's that's very fascinating. Um, so I think I think it's going to grow grow together in tandem. So I think there's going to be um, uh, much you know smaller startups, emerging growth companies that are. Um, going to be able to take advantage of, of this this infrastructure and technology, and I, I also think there's going to be institutions that are able to uh, figure this out and to also you know harness the power of this technology. So um, I, I see it working in tandem. Um, you know, smaller companies are going to do the experimentation; large institutions are going to do the uptake eventually. Um, so I, I, I see it more of a harmonious process. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, everybody always says, um, well, people used to say in crypto, like, get rid of the underwriters on Wall Street. Why should we pay them 7%? And I always tell people, like, these are the guys making sure that the deal's, you know, legitimate. Who are you going to have to pay somebody to do this, right? Yep, yep, yep. And Mason, you know, how has your conversations been or how has the conversation changed over the past, say, year or two years with regard to regulations in the U.S.? Do you think that regulators are becoming more conducive to the space, or do you still think it's going to be kind of a vague uphill battle here? I think, uh, yeah, I, th- I think one thing we've definitely uh, noticed sitting here and watching this is that um, the just the strength of the in the U.S. the, the strength of the of the laws and regulations, um, and I, I think if if we look at when the ICO stuff was taking off. There was a lot of things happening where, you know, we sat here and we were like, all right, that doesn't look right. That doesn't look like, you know, it's in the best interest of all parties. Um, and I think with the enforcement actions, we've seen that, number one, the regulations in the U.S. are very mature, very robust, and they can be adaptable as the technology changes. And I think that's that's really beautiful. Uh, and, and the reason is the we've had new technology come out of nowhere. Um, and there are existing regulations that can help package this uh, and, and, and make this a more productive industry. Um, so I think, uh, I think the regulators uh, did have some catching up to do, but um, and, and in, our conversation, they're, they're, in our conversations, there's ones that are, are very in tune with what's going on, and it's just a matter of being uh, uh, you know, very, very deliberate and very, um, uh, you know, signaling to the market in, in the right way. Um, and then for others, I, I think there's a little bit more of a, a ramp up. But um, I, I, think, I think the good thing is, you know, the, the regulations uh, work uh, and, and they fit here. And so um, I, I don't foresee any, um, I don't know, I, I don't foresee any, anything bad happening to the industry as a result of, 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 of what's going on right now. So I, I think it'll be a smooth transition, but it'll take a little bit of time for people to uh, speak on common terms, figure out what all the pieces are, figure out the risk with the technology, and then help map those into products that are available to, to the larger markets. Got it. And Mason, I just want to zoom out before we close out the interview. I mean, when I'm thinking about token soft solutions, um, 
how do you think about like, like if a customer goes to say securitize and they say, you know, I want you guys to help me issue a token, you know, how do you guys like target that customer from a sales perspective if they're kind of already in securitizes um, wheelhouse? Because I know you guys do portions of, of the technology here. I mean, is it difficult to kind of attract an issuer after they're already in another STO company or is that not something, or am I thinking about this the wrong way? Yeah. So um, our, our, our clients, again, everyone is a, a friend of Tokensoft. Uh, when our clients come in, uh, we're really servicing them at the front end of this, of this process. And so uh, we, we, we try to understand their compliance requirements and make sure that uh, we, can, we can help them as much, as much there as possible. So um, we do have, um, I don't know if we would be taking clients uh, from others. Um, but, uh, but, but definitely it is the case that, you know, when clients come through our platform, we do help service them, um, after the fact as well and, and help them meet their compliance requirements there. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Well, Mason, I mean, I think you answered all the questions I have. Is there anything going on in Tokensoft or, or with yourself that you want to discuss before we close out? Well, uh, yeah, we're uh, so we're, we're definitely excited to you know help uh, continue building the foundational pieces to to you know make digital securities and security tokens uh, a reality, and, and we're committed to helping clients do that in a uh, secure, scalable, and, and and compliant manner. And so um, we're excited to move into uh, 2019 on, on a on a strong foundation and to to help uh, more and more. Uh, issuers of digital assets reach their goals. That, that makes a lot of sense. And on that point, I mean, I remember coming across your medium post on digital assets and digital securities. You know, it might be worth going into this a little bit. I think it's pretty interesting. I mean, what is your um, argument here? Are you arguing that digital assets and digital securities are different? Or are you just arguing for better definitions for the two? What exactly was the, the crux of your report here? Yeah. So if we uh, if if we look how if we start like with the core technology coming about, let's say we're looking at, at Bitcoin, uh, and Bitcoin is a piece of software that was put out there. And people started sending transactions on it. At one point, uh, they wanted to make products with it, and they started forming companies. At some point, uh, those companies got big enough to the point where they were you know servicing a large number of users, and now they had to follow. Uh, then they realized that there were regulations, um, and that was in about 2013, 2014. Um, and I, I think, um, and, 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 and so at some point, this technology does hit into the regulations. And so from our perspective, we like to look at the regulations first, and then look, look down at the technology and pull it up into the regulations. And so that's the reason that uh, we start with uh, terminology like this. Um, so things like digital assets uh, or things like Bitcoin and Ethereum, those need uh, particular licensing um, that is more like uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, you, can, you can hold digital assets if you're, for example, a trust or you have a uh, money transmitter license. Um, but to hold digital securities, uh, it's different licensing that's required there. And so this is us looking top down and saying, OK, what are the regulations? What are the different uh, types of digital assets um, and uh, how do they map? And by doing this, when we interface with, with, with the world and we interface with, uh, with law firms, regulators, uh, we use this as a foundation on which to have a conversation because um, then we remove ambiguity um, and we can speak more accurately to um, the treatment of digital assets, digital securities. Um, on, on the technology side, uh, digital assets are generally managed very passively. Um, with, with Bitcoin, you, you have Bitcoin in your wallet and you can only send and receive. That's all you really need to do with Bitcoin. Um, with digital securities, an issuer has greater needs. Uh, they may have to issue more securities. They may have to do a, a stock split. Uh, they may have to revoke or, or freeze uh, transfers. Um, and so um, that's specialized tooling that I that we perceive from a technology perspective is going to grow in another direction, and that's that's the side of things that we're committing to committed to to helping service. Got it. Um, and that's that's super interesting. So I guess you thought a lot about Ethereum with this whole ICO craze over the past year or two. Um, 
you know, what are your personal opinions on Ethereum and all these ICOs? Do you think the majority are securities or actual utility tokens? I know that we have very conflicting views from regulators where some at the SEC say everything's a security. Some are saying ICOs are legit and even Ethereum could is properly decentralized to be utility token. But, you know, what's your take here on these things? I think in uh, young markets um, that, that emerge very quickly, um, it's important to take the most conservative approach. And so uh, when, we, when we launched the company, obviously it was an observation that those things were going on. And our, our, our goal and our, our thesis was to, to help um, issuers follow the, their relevant uh, regulatory requirements. And so uh, for our clients, we were helping them enforce uh, their regulatory requirements when it, comes, when it came to issuing their asset as a security. Um, and so what I always advocate for is just taking the most uh, conservative approach. Um, don't try to, you know, uh, try to work around the regulations, but fit into the regulations. Um, because at the end of the day, if you were... Uh, breaking the law before you're, you're still breaking the law just because people um, started uh, interpreting these as securities today doesn't mean they shouldn't have been uh, before. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. And Mason, just one uh, specific question I have, because I'm just kind of wondering about this. You know, are you seeing any countries pop up that are, or any countries pop up recently that are doing more, say, STO deals than you've seen in the past? I'm just wondering where the gravity for STOs are outside of the U.S., like if it's a specific country or area or anything like that? Yeah, I think uh, so. Definitely the um, obviously the ICO thing had very broad implications and and captured a lot of attention uh, around the world Um, where we're seeing these um, be more comfortably packaged as as securities offerings are countries where the regulations um, are very mature when it comes to securities laws. Um, there's also uh, a lot of countries out there that, that look to the U.S. Uh, for guidance just because our, our securities laws are very, very mature and very longstanding. Um, and so it's generally uh, any, any, any Western countries um, we're seeing that, um, you know, they're, they're uh, looking to fit into the securities laws. Um, and then the, the Asian countries as well, um, Singapore, the Singapore MAS provided some guidance for these uh, issuance, these types of issuances um, in, I believe it was November of 2017. Um, Switzerland's FINMA passed guidance in February of 2018 for how these should be treated. Uh, and they outlined three different uh, buckets that, that these digital assets may be issued in and, and the relevant regulatory requirements around them. And so... I think one thing we've we've seen is just a trend with uh, with countries around the world starting to uh, starting to provide guidance specific to these uh, digital digital assets and digital securities. Got it. That's that's great, caller. And Mason, just closing out. I mean, what's the roadmap for TokenSoft over the next you know twelve to eighteen months? Is it just you know the tech's in place? Let's hit sales, or is it more education, or are you hoping to release other products? You know, what's on your What's on your whiteboard in your office? Yeah, so um, I think we've been we've been very active on the sales side uh, since we started. Uh, we didn't have to pivot our product or anything, so we we we're still launching on the same platform, launching clients on the same platform. Um, for us, I think this year is more about uh, regulatory infrastructure, uh, figuring out you know do we need anything else um, to provide better services to our clients. I'm going to continue onboarding uh, clients as well, and 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 continuing servicing them. Um, but that's pretty much it. Uh, we're going to be doing the same thing we're uh, same thing we're doing before. Um, hopefully, we'll we'll service uh, you know more clients, uh, larger clients, um, and and we're we're definitely happy to to you know help them help them reach their goals when it comes to you know issuing these assets. That's awesome. Well, Mason, thanks so much for coming on. And where can people follow you and learn more about what you're doing at TokenSoft? Yeah. Um, so uh, you can, uh, I think Twitter is a, a great place uh, to, to stay up to date. And so uh, you may want to follow me uh, on Twitter. And my handle is uh, Masonic underscore tweets. Um, and uh, you can also follow TokenSoft at TokenSoft, I-N-C, TokenSoft, Inc. 
on, on Twitter. That's awesome. Well, Mason, thanks so much for coming back on. I hope to have you back on again in some time so we could catch back up. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Please rate, review, and share the podcast so other people find it. And be sure to visit 51pct.io and enter your email to get our research alerts delivered directly in your inbox.